Uh, let's say a politician, a contributor in, 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 in international relations, diplomacy, and, and many intellectual aspects. He is also the director of the Omni City, Highland City, and uh, perspective. But uh, uh, now the floor is to uh, uh, Mr. Highland uh, about uh, the uh, Highland City and uh, the concept of Omni City and so on. Mr. Highland, the floor is yours. Before I begin my remarks, I want to point out that behind me on the screen will be projected images relating to Highland Town. I don't know if they're there already, but they will change as I give the lecture. And by way of information, Highland Town is a place of 830 acres, projected 30 to 40,000 people. This is the form base code for Highland Town. And in, uh, this is a map uh, as an example of the uh, planned layout for Highland Town. And then the uh, other map I have here discusses in an illustrative way the various types of neighborhoods that will be in Highland Town. If you could take these for me, I would appreciate it and just put them on my seat. Take off the, this one? Pardon me? What did you say? No, 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 I don't. They're, these images are just going to project behind me while I uh, give my presentation here today. Thank you, Dr. Harishi, uh, for organizing this group of talks on new urbanism comprising the first annual Gemma Highland Lectures at UBT. Your interest in and commitment to architecture are well known. Your vision, Dr. Harishi, a city virtually in itself an academic built world of excellence, now joined by an outstanding building, the Gemma Building. Well done, Dr. Harishi. Thank you, UBT Academic Council, professors, students, and staff, honored speakers, guests from throughout Kosovo and beyond. I'm honored to be speaking in tandem with such an accomplished group. Uh, I know that later on, uh, Andreas Duane, the founder of New Urbanism, will be speaking. That is indeed a great honor. This university, in having Andreas Duane, joins the greatest universities and academic groups in the world. He is the founder of New Urbanism, which has shaken the entire foundations of the American contracting and building industry. I'm honored also to be in the company earlier today of engineer Prime Minister Alban Kurti, architect Mayor Param Rama, both persons of great visions. The interactions I've had with them are characterized by respect and exchange of ideas. That's the key thing, exchange of ideas, open ideas, that resulting in them sharing their considerable wisdom with us here today. Grace Mayor Rama and Vice Mayor Zoge and several others, a splendid new Gemma Avenue, which will be the largest avenue in all of Kosovo, is well underway as well as much more. That these lectures are, are co-named Gemma Highland is itself an honor as my friend of long standing and uh, Jim Gemma is not only America's greatest high-end residential contractor, but he is, as described to me by the entire Kosovo founding presidential family, literally a co-founding president of the Republic of Kosovo, together with the esteemed Ibrahim Rogova, with whom I discussed French in between long bits of cigarette smoke. Uh, of the free and of the independent in perpetuity sovereign republic of Kosovo. I am confident that Jim would agree with these words, build a house, build a nation. Jim has done both, Kosovo, his supreme construction. New urbanism and omni-urbanism is people-centric, espousing work, live, housing, commercial, and recreational buildings in close walkable proximity, that being Mayor Rama's seven minutes ideal. Now this bloody page is upside down, that's not a good thing. Um, new urbanism and omni-urbanism focuses on great design, 
great living spaces, encourages community, makes for much happier citizens, is great for business, conserves energy and building materials, and makes it easier for jurisdictions to provide services and to fund them. This is a problem. Sprawl is unfundable. But most of all, new urbanism and omni-urbanism enliven the soul and perpetrate beauty. They foster places people want to be. They contributed to a way forward to greater prosperity, which is mentioned above us. Ironically, arcane laws often forbid, except where amended by courageous new urbanists, such as Andreas Duane, the planning of very built environments, the very built environments people, in fact, want to be in. The best of Copenhagen, Florence, Presren, would be literally impossible today if it were not for the work of new urbanist proponents. Committing to realizing compelling new urbanist and omni-urban neighborhoods as a national goal applied to all jurisdictions, curtailing the sprawl will go a long way to contribute to making Kosovo a brilliant economy similar to those of other small jurisdictions. Israel, Singapore, the Netherlands, and Malta come to mind. People want to live in compelling environments, very appealing to local citizens and people from around the world. Build an economy, build a vibrant economy, build great neighborhoods and housing, and they will not only stay, but others indeed will come. That means good business for all quarters, from construction to metalwork and mattresses, and from wine to skiing, mining, and all aspects of technology. Perhaps one day computer chips. Kosovo already has an IT venue with eight billion views. Uh, Rector Harishi spoke with a long, young man last night. And Kosovo is a manufacturing drones. I spoke with that young man yesterday. In order to jumpstart new urbanism, why not identify a location and straight away agree a new Kosovo charter city, what I call omni-cities, be designed along new urbanist and omni-urban lines. That would put Kosovo on the urban planning global map. Omni-charter cities, quote, give government and planners a chance to look beyond the status quo and create new solutions that are effectively, purposefully designed. Basically, charter cities free jurisdictions of often outmoded laws that hinder smart, reasonable, consistent, profitable, inclusive growth. New urbanism and omni-urbanism are planning ethos that will give added luster to all Kosovo built world jurisdictions, let alone a Kosovo omni-charter city. Considerable awareness of historic and contemporary urban design, well documented for research inspiration, grace the internet, that coupled with innovation in transportation, building materials, building technology, the building operations technology, not to forget ease of daily communication, affords contemporary urban designers much perspective heretofore unfathomable, thereby allowing urban designers fertile ground for development of assiduously curated, compelling community fostering new neighborhoods and towns. Now that's quite a sentence. St statist architectural urban design models, often emanating from rigid, even extremist political ideologies, often greatly influence or still rule the day. The negative impact of such plans are often lessened by judiciously commissioned, compelling new trophy buildings. That said, in general, the design narrative would appeal to the Stasi. Although exciting contemporary architecture, from Zahad Hadid to Calatrava, the latter a personal favorite of mine, who I have written about and met, is celebratory. 
Such buildings are often in new projects placed out of context, isolated from their neighbors. Already compelling, imagine such splendid architectural work more judiciously situated in new urbanist, omni-urbanist neighborhoods. That said, new urbanism is gaining traction all over the world, and awakening is, in, is occurring. The Congress of New Urbanism is a wonderful place to which you should all participate if you ever have a chance when you are in America. Indeed, it would be great to have a, an annual meeting of the Congress of New Urbanism right here in Kosovo. New Urbanism has come a long way since Andreas Duane's visionary first steps in the 1980s at Charleston Place. And since and since I suggested before dinner in the early 1980s to now King Charles that he also champion architecture. His Majesty became a leading proponent, founding unique renditions of new urbanism in Palmberry and other communities. Andreas Duane and His Majesty's collaboration with ingenious urban planner Leon Crer, with whom I have addressed my own Highland Town project, are well known indeed. Leon Crer has contributed much to realizing a new urbanist triumph in Guatemala's Cayela, and Andreas has realized hundreds of successful new urbanist projects, which, by the way, are now the most expensive and most desired per square foot real estate in all the United States of America. New urbanist design acumen is built on the urban design genius of Anka Watt, Fata Porsikri, Isfahan, Machu Picchu, the great towns around and atop the Indian mounds of America, one ironically uh, atop an Indian mound called Highland, which is quite amazing. Benin City, Washington, D.C., Venice, and Le Corbusier's Chandigarh. And Presren, thus reaching back from Presren into the annals of history to Illyria and indeed to Dardania. Prime Minister, brother, President Rogova's beloved Dardania. All connected, all calling from the annals of deep history, of urban design history, to be emulated in the present era. New urbanism and omni-urbanism invites us to view urban planning another way, one that derives its ethos and inspiration from places not unlike the ancient cities, towns, villages, and souks of Kosovo, all the while reinventing their design language, integrating that design language, not forsaking it, not turning your backs on it, into a compelling new built world Kosovo vernacular language architecture, a new vernacular infused with both tradition and contemporary design that is the omni-urbanism way to the future. Importantly, new urban design viewpoints have and will continue to emerge, displaying often tired, ideologically influenced design protocols. Even though countless buildings, many uh, may or may not be compelling, even exciting, in practice, to the extent that they are disconnected from the ebb and flow of human exertion, the net result is an unhappy one. The mass creation of such unhappy spaces throughout the world is collectively injurious to the very human spirit that must propel us to the future. If this monumental construction effort could be orchestrated in such a way as to marshal a profound sense of community, humanity would be that far more better off. Ironically, the existing urban cacophony is made possible by great advances in sanitary, travel, and building techniques, materials, and financing strategies, the latter 
often ruinous, unfortunately. The buildings that emerge from this movement are often literally works of art. They are both exhilarating and concerning, as often unnecessarily many planners and market forces indeed allow such edifices to be placed in isolation, unconnected to their surroundings. Clearly, there is much to be gleaned from urban design protocols that allow for more assiduous placement of these otherwise exciting structures. I recall Pat Kluge, who I will remind you was the wife of the media genius uh, who was a great friend of mine, gazing out at the hills beyond her magnificent house in rural Virginia. And she was imagining her cousin, Zaha Hadid, who had just visited her, imagined that Zaha would design a magnificent country building there on the hills beyond her house, a literal work of art, which she spoke about. F fully integrated, however, f and this is very important, Zaha's building fully integrated into a plan much animated by her great classicist friend and designer, the late David Easton, with whom I discussed Pat's visit to its coastline, to this wonderful national treasure, the most vital water treasure, one without which Kosovo would cease to literally sustain her independence. Any talk of giving up that water must be anathema. I imagine the town architecture as a contemporary twist on Souk, Ottoman, Islamic, and one of Kosovo's national treasures, one of the great national architectural treasures, Dekane Monastery and Pesh Monastery. All this mix an inspiration for this new Kosovo village on Lake Trump. And it's important to use that name, Lake Trump, because it bridges us to America and Albania and to Kosovo. Thank goodness Kosovo, in planning its omni-urbanist future, has such a national tre treasure as Lake Trump, the Ever River's cave water, not depending on the climatic, a national treasure. Best safeguard that treasure. I am Pei, who I first met in Kuwait in the 1970s, often sat next to me, first left, my second table left, at New York's famed Vodor restaurant. Our discussing his now iconic Louvre glass pyramids and bamboo-inspired hometown Shichu Museum, both conduits to community, well-situated in community. Incongruous, one might think, to the, to the Louvre, brilliantly, however, serving as their main entra entrance, and the museum perfectly set in an historic district of the city and built in a contemporary way, but inspired by bamboo construction. Contemporary design may and does, in good measure, judiciously place, serve to enhance community when allowed integration with more than willing built world neighbors. Sadly, often rules and regulations animate against this possible experience of brilliance. All these thoughts hold for both practitioners of modern, contemporary, and classic architecture and urban design. Often the most oppressive aspects of the 20th century's isms are all too evident in design decisions. We are all reminded of pillboxes by the thousands throughout Albania and virtually all of Denver, Colorado being leveled in the name of new urbanist renewal. The net result, a city of parking lots. That until and however limited infusion of new urbanism provided the Denver Union Railway Station area with new vitality. One not predicated solely but what is by what is best only for the automobile, human concern, brought center stage, life returning to Union Station. No pun intended, but union of spirit and mortar emerged when spaces became human-centric once again. 
Good job on that one to my good old longtime skiing friend, Peter Fair, and his partners. They did an outstanding job, a way forward for Kosovo. Correctly so, new urbanists seriously call into question the, though originally most often well-intended, worst excesses that plague much of American post-war planning. Such resulting in unlimited sprawl of the worst kind. The first among them is the all too often acceptance as the absolute norm when urban design fosters isolation. That encouraged by arduous travel efforts necessary to connect to family, to recreation, to health care, to faith, to shopping destinations. As a case in point, my dear friend Susan Taylor and I spent six hours of New Jersey car time one Saturday to accomplish basic errands. In my youth, growing up in more inherently new urbanist Salem, Marblehead, and Hamilton, Massachusetts, the similar task would have taken at most one hour in car travel time to achieve. Susan explained, that our travel time was absolutely the norm. Six hours, it was amazing. In urban sprawl, easy connectivity is practically non-existent. Unbridled urban sprawl may endanger municipalities, even states. Judicious use of power, of the power grid of foremost importance and crucial to the existence of Kosovo, especially with an antiquated power plant. Poor use of existing power resources doom functionality. Today, India, Germany, and China face serious power challenges. Omni-urban planning viewpoints seek to sustain wise uses of precious energy. Imagine Kosovo without an updated power plant, or even worse, not unequivocally sustaining control of its most important water resource, Lake Trump, as has been suggested by the Central European powers. Even the best aspects of our new urbanist and omni-urbanist advances will be useless. The Kosovo we know and love will cease to exist. Sprawl, lack of adequate power, no control of water may achieve what armies have been unable to succeed in recent decades. Both new urbanists and omni-urbanists seek to sustain human focus, community building urban planning narratives, ones that remove asphalt and vacant lots as the placeholders and destinations, instead encouraging apartment buildings, various types of buildings, townhouses, houses, dog runs, parks, technology centers, ice rinks, barbershops, to live in close proximity to each other to Walmarts, art museums, medical clinics, office buildings, and senior living facilities, living in a two, three, four, as Mayor Rama said, and as I know the Prime Minister believes, distance from each other. I wonder if Alice Walton will recall the early 1990 suggestions I made to her that Walmart, the international dry goods store chain, des design their design team, imagine that the buildings necessary to serve some of the purposes I just mentioned, literally serve as veneer for her father Sam's countless dynamic emporiums. Imagine, Walmart surrounded by adjacent facilities literally forming the walls of the four sides of the store. That would go a long way to sustaining interest in and allow immediate community access to big box stores even in the online era of shopping. Alice showed me her father's first store near Fayetteville, Arkansas, that proudly situated at the corner of, guess what, a classic 19th century Arkansas town square. Mrs. Sam Walton, and she was a very good cook, I might add, over dinner recalled the place with great fondness. It was her, it was Mrs. Walton's place of very happy memories. After my friend Washington Post editor Ben Bradley's funeral at Ben and Sally's house, I brief briefly spoke with Jeff Bezos, 
mentioning my digital magazine and the need for an amalgamation of his digital empire with brick and mortar stores encompassing much of what I have alluded in this speech today. There clearly needs to be massive rethinking in the retail world, a huge opportunity for new urbanism, a huge opportunity for Kosovo urban building. I can imagine in this wonderful manifestation of Kosovo prosperity, apartment buildings and townhouses all throughout this neighborhood, cheek to jowl with all these buildings. Although a somewhat exaggerated comment, in new urbanism and omni-urbanism, one is afforded the opportunity to walk by in and through any number of structures, affording opportunities so to do while walking along a street comprising your work, recreation, entertainment, and living spaces, among others or where efficient public transportation, such as found throughout Europe, assures that you are able to be in close proximity to these frequently visited destinations. All of the above, rather than at often great speed in a machine that consumes much of your income, depletes the earth, and no matter recent energy innovations, these new options still, one way or another, harmful to life, let alone limb. We want to celebrate the automobile, but in good measure. Highland Town will one day have an automobile center, an automobile re regard, uh, repair garage, an automobile display ground, and that will celebrate cars and automobiles in the way they should. Ironically, the seemingly enlightened cadre who espouse what I refer to as solitary architecture, urban planning, will argue that new urbanists are rigid. To the contrary, as CEO and design director of Highland Town, I am constantly being told by developers that the poor situation in American urban planning is due to unchangeable, unbending, now archaic rules and regulations that allow for no deviation from already proven poor, financially disastrous to the taxpayer planning protocols. The, set, the flexibility of new urbanist approach is best characterized by my first encounter with Andreas Drane now some 38 years ago. Having read, as I recall, about his Charleston Place project, I think it was the Atlantic Magazine, and having arrived at the same development conclusions as Andreas, I decided to purchase at his first project, Charleston Place, not Seaside, Charleston Place. Realizing that by purchasing three townhouse lots and converting them into two 45-foot wide townhouses, the block in which they resided would become a beautiful five-part Palladian villa. I requested that just that be done. Andreas and the developer agreed in a heartbeat. Try to do that in the urban sprawl uh, culture. Flexibility personified. Andreas tells me he has told that story in lectures many times. The pristina open air, marvelous, Mother Teresa Boulevard, with cafes, shops, business, apartment, cultural, and government buildings, including the Swiss hotel where I'm staying, exemplifies in several ways the ethos of new urbanism and omni-urbanism. Kosovo has much to build on with a dynamic preservation community and a plethora of architectural design and planning leadership open to new thoughts and an engineer, PM Kurti, architect, Mayor Rama. How uh, fortunate Kosovo and Pristina are. They were the first people I suggested this conference to of course, Recta Harishi, the very first. Kosovo, as is the United States of America, suffers from unhappy urban sprawl. Too often, lonely tower after tower. There is hope afoot in Pristina, hope afoot in Kosovo, and America for a much better situation. Embracing new urbanism and omni-urban tenants, Kosovo will greatly increase its ability to formulate concrete circumstances from which to build a prof prosperous future by, most importantly, more effectively and successfully joining the ranks of the ever-growing best aspects of the global ch city charter movement. 
rather than charter city, which has come to be synonymous often with threatening existing local, often by no means always ill-functioning political structures, I prefer to use the word omni-town. That in a nod to seeking constructive input from both always while fully embracing the new, in particular, as concerns livability, beauty, and sense of place. The architectural styles may be traditional, transitional, contemporary, or better still, the best, a mix of them all. That guided by both transects and architectural standards come rule books. Transects, architectural standards, you're seeing some of those things behind me on the screen. I hope it's flashing. This uh, balance is exactly what we are seeking to achieve in Highland Town on 830 acres, 336 he hectares, as an omni-urban town which is now in the process of being formulated in Mead, Colorado in the United States of America. Acceptance of Highland Town's visionary planning will require much thinking out of the box. All of us want to avoid what New York Times journalists Anna Cote warns against when in her July 20th, 2023 article, quote, America, the bland end of quote, she writes about the United States, quote, across the country, new developments are starting to look the same way, raising fears that cities are losing their unique cha charm, end of quote. Nobel Prize winner economist Paul M. Aroma advocates that the overwhelming encumbrance to building well-run, prosperous communities is poor government, that the, the creation of new jurisdictions, sustainability free of such encumbrances, is a pragmatic way forward. According to Romer and others, there are rules and regulations that inhibit, inhibit growth. As reported in the Financial Times article by David Pilling, quote, why he, Romer, asked in a 2009 TED Talk, did many Af Africans have access to mobile phones, a modern technology, but not to electricity, which became widely available 100 years ago, end of quote. From his answers, poor rules, poor laws, governments demanding cheap electricity, suppliers unable to contribute at a loss, hence 600 million Africans are without power due to that, vort that unhappy vortex. Corruption, adherence to old, hopelessly fixed ways, condemn societies to perpetual self-destruction. Omni-cities, judiciously formulated, contribute to hope for a better future. Visionary design Mavern, Prince Mohammed bin Salam Al Saud's new city, Neom, though most probably short on new urbanist and omni urbanism tenants, I must admit, in Saudi Arabia's northwest, one very much hopes one day is such a place, one substantially free of numerous old limitations imposed by now antiquated tradition, un uncontained corruption and religion. While visiting Elat uh, during a 1966 excursion from Kibbutz Andor in Israel, where I was spending summer holiday, previously at home, my National Geographic map guide sort of informed me, I wondered why there was not a substantial Saudi city just beyond us across the Red Sea, where I knew there were snow-capped mountains in winter. Prince Mohammed's city will make the political map of the Middle East change forever. However modest by comparison, a visionary omni-city will contribute much to making the map of Kosovo and the entire region change forever. New urbanist, omni-urban, and uh, emerging new charter cities will prove to be great testing grounds for entire countries. Their successes will ex be exported to all directions. Kuwait is a new urbanist planned country. Kosovo wants to weigh in on this, it, it, this in narrative and be a beacon to which people come to see what's happening, what's going on. I would think it would be great to have a new urbanist uh, conference here in Kosovo uh, 
uh, an international one, uh, a, a, an even larger expansion on this already outstanding uh, discussion here today. When Kosovo is part of a rapid-fire international rail network in a position to more easily supply much of its substantial national resource to the world, it will by then or well before be in a position to supply, one very much hopes, some of the 450,000 or so components found in some computer chips or something along that line. This inevitability is quite possible in a world where several dozen countries interact, some in modest ways, enabling chip culture to survive. Holland, home to ASML, among the smallest jurisdictions in the world, just about the most important. The, Katova, the Kosova tech sector, already alive, will boom. Great universities such as UBT, adequate and total control of water resources, Lake Trump, most important, updated energy plans, a new power plant, great housing, good insurance, and a stable region will contribute to make this possible. Look at Germany today to see what happens when energy sources are inadequate or fail. New urbanism, as is all development, depends on adequate energy resources. To be ready, Kosovo wants to have well in place a built world environment that is beneficial to present freedom generation Kosovo citizens, metal workers, miners, healthcare professionals, teachers, doctors, and business people, and applying to new generations in professions yet to come. All Kosovo will be greatly enhanced by new urbanism and urbanism. They will, in the world of urban planning and building, augment and grow Kosovo's already enormous sense of purpose and sense of place. Jim Gemma Boulevard wants to be at the center of just such a visionary omni-urban town. Build omni-urbanism in Kosovo, you build a nation, a way forward to great expanded opportunity. Long live Dardania, and thank you for this opportunity to share my views. So on the map just behind here, there are these uh, bits and pieces that uh, you've seen. And we would be happy to send them to you at some other time. But I am going to give the floor to an eminent great man who follows me, the eminent gentleman right here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Highland. Great speech, and, uh, and I think we had a reflection. We have here professors and the students from uh, School of Architecture, Spatial Planning, Civil Engineering and Infrastructure, Energy, Environment, and all those 22 schools. They completely combine and create this uh, small scale uh, new urbanism concept, which when you see the new urbanism uh, definitions of, of, of cities, town, regions, uh, uh, and so on. So we can think where we are, we are located, in which way. But I think exactly I'm, I'm as a believer of this uh, concept where you combine things with a, with a human-centered place and then around the values which come together and make things happen. Uh, uh, we will, uh, based on this, we will continue with our professor Honor Professor here, he came uh, before two days to visit us first time in Kosovo from, Prof from University of Lisbon, the department, uh, the, the faculty for, for technology and the department for construction engineering. We invited him to come here and, uh, and to contribute on different aspects. Guess, yesterday we had a very good conference uh, about the publication, the productivity in the scientific publication because Professor has made 600 publications one of the most cited professors. And we have with Portugal a very friendly relationship. They recognize us. We have also culturally some, uh, 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 let's say, similarities. And, and, uh, and we wanted to continue and have it. They, they contribute a lot. We have a very good co cooperation with different universities there. And uh, we wanted today to, to have the view, Professor uh, George de Brito, is a long name, but I, I took the main. 
uh, to present a bit the perspective from the from the from the construction from the building, but with a sustainable based view, which again coming to the same uh, the same concept. So, Professor Brito, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, maybe we can just because of presentation we can uh, move this uh, uh, part here so that we can we can see uh, more. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'd like to start by, by uh, thanking the presentation of, of the rector of UBT, uh, which I now consider a good friend, uh, and for the invitation for coming here. I did not know uh, Kosovo well. Uh, I, I am very surprised by what, what I've seen. Uh, and um, and uh, one thing that struck me when I came from the airport to here is the level of development and the level of construction that has been going on for the last years. So I thought, uh, if I'm going to talk about sustainable construction, and since everything that I've seen is made of concrete, why not talk about sustainable concrete? Because concrete is, is and will remain the most used material uh, by man, only second to water, which is not really a man-made material. So, uh, 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 concrete is unbeatable from a point of view of the competi uh, co co uh, competitiveness because it is uh, by far the most used material uh, in, in building. Uh, even in the United States, it is now the main construction material, beating uh, steel, beating uh, uh, wood, timber. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, why not talk about uh, sustainable concrete? And so that's what I'm going to do with your, with your permission. Uh, okay, this is the, 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 the content of the, of the short presentation I'm going to, to make. I'm going to discuss two concepts which most people take for granted. I'm going to discuss some barriers to the upscaling of this notion of sustainable concrete, because there are barriers, okay? Um, it is much easier to keep things as they are. It is cheaper to keep things as they are, but we need to change, okay? We need to change. And then I'm going to talk about, just mention uh, uh, the strategies that we have devised for sustainable concrete, and uh, then present the final remarks, which are the conclusions from that study. Um, now, I'm not going to give answers here. I'm going to ask questions. And I'm going to ask you to think about this, okay? So, would you think that the choices that we have is between progress and the environment, or can we have both? Think about that. Can we have both, okay, the progress and the environment? Okay, can we have sustainability, and can we achieve sustainability because of concrete or against concrete? We have to think about that, okay? Uh, yes, that's what, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to try to prove. Now, let's think about cement. Concrete, as you know, has cement on it and its composition. And you probably know that more than 90% of the environmental impacts of concrete have to do with cement. And we should keep that in mind. On the other hand, on the other hand, cement is what makes concrete such a great material. So we have here a balance. We, we have here a balance in which we, we have a, a, an extraordinary material, which is cement, but it is also extraordinarily impacting 
on the, on the environment. Now, another thing, this is a little bit more technical. Uh, what do we want from concrete? We want it to be strong. So we, 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 we are asking for mechanical performance. And we also want it to last. So we want durability. Okay? But are the two things connected? We'll, we'll discuss that later on. Now, uh, we, I mentioned cement. Cement is a binder, so it means that it, it agglomerates the other materials. So, in most regulations, we have the concept of minimum binder content, which means that regulations force us to have a certain minimum amount of, normally, cement. And my question is, is that a goal or is it a means to achieve something? Because that amount of cement, normally what it does is increase the strength and increase the durability. Okay? But what we want is not more cement or a high quantity of cement. What we want is strength and durability. So let's see if we can get both without so much cement. Okay, so uh, when we talk about the sustainability of concrete uh, uh, structures, we have to think that this is a multi-criteria problem. It is not solved by a single parameter, okay? And, and uh, let me go on to, to prove this point. Okay, the, 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 this lecture was inspired by a paper which I'm publicizing here. Uh, it was published around two years ago. Uh, it is now a highly cited paper. And uh, for those of you who wish to know a little bit more about this area, uh, I, I, I suggest that you have a look at it. It is publicly available. So let's now discuss the, the, concept, of, the concept of sustainable concrete. I'm sorry? Hmm? Okay. No, no, no. I'm, I want to go back here. A little bit more? One more. Here. No. I want to go to the front. Here. To, the, to the back, yes. Okay. Now, this is a possible definition of sustainable concrete. Concrete that achieves a given goal with minimal negative impacts. Okay? It is a simple definition. So we want something from concrete, but we want to have it with a minimum impact on the environment, minimum impact on costs, etc., etc. Okay, you all know about sustainability. Sustainability is based on three pillars. Environmental, which is what most people think about, but there is no sustainability without economic sustainability. It is very easy to do something that is very good from an environmental point of view if you spend a lot of money, but it's not sustainable. Okay? And so the third pillar is the social pillar jobs, uh, uh, um, gender equality, things like that, okay? Uh, you, you are thinking, this has nothing to do with concrete, it does, it does. Okay, now, are we looking only for technical performance when we build something, or are we looking for functionality? Let's define functionality. What is functionality? Functionality is something working the way we want it to work. So, think of a car. You want some things from a car. Different people want different things from their cars. And we have to adapt to those different things. Different people want different things from their houses. And we have to adapt. So that's functionality. OK. Um, normally, what we do when we try to understand whether something is functional um, is perform, uh, something is sustainable, I'm sorry, is perform the so-called sustainability analysis. But sustainability analysis are not single. They are multiple. So when you have different studies, some of these studies differ in terms of the time frame they analyze. Some studies only analyze the production of the material. But then they don't go on the application of the material, the life cycle of the material, and the end of the life of the material. Okay? So that changes the perspective and the results. Also. Some studies do not take into account the avoided impacts. For example, when you use a, something that is a waste and you put it back into the production cycle, 
you avoid all the impacts of the waste, dumping, for example. Okay? And some studies do, some other studies don't. And of course, other things are a little bit more technical, like the actual way the impact, the, the impact is measured. So different studies do it in a different way. When we compare them, the result is this. Uh, sorry. Uh, the result. I'm sorry. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I'm having a problem here. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we have contradictory results. And contradictory results are very bad. Why? Because we lose confidence in them. So we have people saying, no, we need to go this way because it is more sustainable. But then the studies in which these conclusions are based have for the same parameter one or ten. So outside people say, this is worthless. I can't believe in any of these. Okay? And this is an issue. But let's suppose that we perform the analysis, the sustainability analysis, in such a way that they can be used and we can uh, uh, work with them. But normally, it is not either scientists or technicians who make the big decisions. It is politicians whom we elect. Okay? So they have the right to make the decisions. Okay? The results of these sustainability studies are not straightforward. It's like a car. Let's imagine that you look at a car. And can you imagine a car that is both, that, that, that has, is the least costly, the least environmental impact, the fastest, the most safe? It does not exist. So all studies, in terms of sustainability, give results that are not simple to analyze, even for people who know about it. Imagine for politicians to take, make decisions based on those studies. Let's move on to the, another pillar of sustainability, costs. Costs have a problem. When you anal analyze sustainability, the costs are very spe uh, um, site-specific. The same material here in Kosovo has different impacts from in my hometown, Lisbon. Okay? The same material different impacts. And of course, the impacts are also time dependent. They vary over time. So this makes the studies difficult. I'm pointing out here difficulties, okay? Not solutions yet, okay? The social impacts. Well, the social impacts are by nature holistic, which means they have to do with very different areas. So you have to compare things that cannot be compared. How do you compare uh, uh, human life safety with uh, gender equality. How many, <laughs> how do you compare it? It's not possible, okay? They are qualitative by nature, okay? And they are very polemic, very polemic, the social impacts. So normally, the analysis of the social impacts is left out of this sustainability analysis. Let's now discuss the concept of functionality. Functionality, I tried to define it, I, I'm not sure I, I achieved my goals, but it is hard to define, it is harder to quantify, it, it, it is even harder to compare. Okay? So, how do you compare two houses? The same problem. One house is possibly better in some aspects, but it's more expensive. So which one is better? You have, you have to make decisions. Now let's move on to concrete design. I don't know if there is anyone in the audience that you, you, you probably understand what I'm going to say, but uh, not many people. Concrete design for people who design concrete is based on characteristic uh, strength values, which are based on a single parameter, which is the strength class. Okay? The strength class. So we say a, a certain concrete has this strength class, another concrete has this strength class. And according to the way we design concrete today, there are relationships which are established with all the other properties. There's one problem. Even though this is very straightforward to use, it is oversimplistic. Those relationships for, for people who know enough about concrete are not true. They are not accurate. So we are working today, concrete, concrete designs. I am a concrete designer 
or was, um, we believe blindly on relationships that are not really true. Okay? And that is why it is so difficult for concrete designers to start using unconventional materials. Because they believe that if they use the conventional materials, the relationships they have here, they believe it just as it came from God. They are absolutely accurate. They are not. Okay? So for unconventional materials, it's exactly the same problem. Okay? Now, the functionality of concrete. What do we want from concrete? Okay? Well, it depends on whether we're talking about a column, we're talking about a slab or a beam. We want different things from these elements. We de it, it also depends on the actions. Kosovo has earthquakes, so does Portugal. But you talk about earthquakes in northern Germany and they'll say, I don't care about that. I don't design concrete, uh, concrete and concrete structures for earthquakes because we don't have them. But it makes a huge difference. We also have the external environment. Concrete must be designed to withstand the environment. And some environments are very aggressive, others are not. This column here has no problems. But if it is by the sea and exposed directly to sea breeze, it has big problems. So, uh, and there are other, other issues. So, now I introduce here a new concept which is the functional unit. Okay? The functional unit is absolutely indispensable for, to make any comparative analysis. Let's, uh, let's go back to a car. Okay? Let's imagine that we are trying to make a serious study about three cars. Okay? You know that no car is like any other car. So you have to define characteristics. You are going to say, so the car I want is the cheapest car that can achieve this speed, has this rating in terms of safety, and if we could rate that, is beautiful to the point of class whatever. Okay? So we define those characteristics, and the functional unit is a car that can do those things. Okay? And then we compare the three cars, they are different, but each of them has to achieve what we call this functionality. And then we can compare. We have a functional unit. Okay? Uh, most studies that you see on concrete are not correct. They, concrete, they, they compare concrete in terms of mass. They say, I'm going to compare this concrete, your one cubic meter of it, with another concrete which has also one cubic meter. The problem is this concrete has a much higher strength than that one. So it's not fair to compare them. Do you understand? It's like comparing a Rolls Royce with a Morris Mini in terms of costs. It does not make sense. Of course, the Morris Mini is much better. But it simply is not as good. Okay, so even when people compare in, in terms of the same compressive strength, the concrete, concrete co the, the compressive strength is not everything in concrete. We need to consider durability. Okay? If the same concrete, two concretes have the same compressive strength, but one lasts for 50 years and the other lasts for 25 years, in theory, you should multiply the cost of the second one by two. Right? Okay? So, that's, that's the, the bad news here, I will move along. The bad news is, in stricto sensu, we could only compare two columns alike. I could compare this column made with material A with that column made with material B. Because they have exactly the same demands, exactly the same functionality. Okay? But let's move on. Um, I will... I will just introduce here one concept which I think is very important. I believe that we are going to design everything in the future, not just concrete structures, everything, from the point of view of performance-based design. So, instead of designing according to regulations, what we want is, I want a concrete that does this. I want a car that does that. I want a house that does something else. And then I design for that.
Forget about regulations. Regulations should only fix the minimum standards. A guide, exactly. We should say, okay, so someone inside this house cannot be too cold. Okay? But then, if it is higher than that, it's up to us. It's up for the client to say, I want a house in which I can be uh, in, in shorts every year, during the whole year. You, and I'm ready to pay for that. Then we do it. Okay? Now, it is very important to talk here about sustainable concrete. Okay? Everybody wants everything to be sustainable. Right. I don't think we disagree here. However, we, don't, we haven't managed to achieve and to apply sustainable concrete or sustainable cars or sustainable anything else. Okay? Why? Well, to start with, because there are many ways of doing it. Okay? This is good news. This is good news. We can achieve sustainable concrete through many ways. And this is the second good news. Okay? There is enough information from research to apply some of these ideas okay, to make sustainable concrete. The bad news are many of the solutions are done by people like me. I don't have a company. I'm not worried about, you know, actually making the idea work. So some of them are too raw. Some of them are too theoretical, okay? And so we, we think we are solving the world when really, in practice, in the real world, we, things do not work, okay? So let's, let's just for exemplification purposes, mention how we could use, a, 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 um, I'm sorry, before that. Um, as I told you, the, the concrete designers or car designers or house designers have fear of new solutions. It's natural. We always feel more comfortable when we use the solutions that we know, that we know how they work. So, you know, to move forward, Henry Ford moved move forward, but he was risking. And many people probably told Henry Ford, hey, come on, don't go that way because it can go wrong. I, I would rather have the old type of cars, very expensive, okay? Only a few people could afford it. He had an idea, and the idea was to make cars for everybody. Okay, so, but people, people fear the unknown. And concrete designers, guess what? They fear the unknown, okay? So, but the unknown here is based on what I told you before. People have blind faith in the well-known practices. Concrete designers believe that the rules they are using now will function for every type of material, conventional material, which is not true. Okay? So they shouldn't be afraid to use unconventional materials because with conventional materials there will be some, some uncertainty, but so it happens today. Only we believe there isn't. Okay? So, the, we have a conundrum here, which means that because there is no practical need for new types of concrete, new types of material, there is no need to adapt the codes. At the same time, because there are no fit-to-purpose rules in the codes, there is no practical need to apply those materials. We need to change this. And the, I, I gave you an idea. Now, let's, let's give the example that I wanted to mention a moment ago. Recycled aggregates concrete. Do you know what this is? It means that all the rubble that we create by destroying buildings, instead of dumping it in some place where they ruin the environment, let's crush them and use them in concrete. Concrete is the greatest sink there is, in a good sense. We can put it in concrete, we can put just about everything, even, even dangerous materials, even hazardous materials we can put in concrete because concrete stabilizes them. So concrete is, is a great opportunity to, to get rid of materials that are waste. So it looks like a good idea, right? Recycle aggregate concrete. However, we have identified many barriers to the use of these barriers. barriers. Um, so for example, we do not separate the wastes at the source. So we have the best 
potential recycled aggregates together with recycled aggregates that would not be good at all. So when they are mixed, they are all bad. That's one problem. Second problem, I told you about that before. Chain, supply chain. Okay, demand, supply. If we do not need, there's no supply. If there is no supply, we are unable to use it. So it's a vicious circle. The low quality of recycled aggregates that results mostly from this. Recycled aggregates that are now being produced have low quality because they are mixed. All the materials are mixed and they are not all of the same quality. I've already mentioned this. Lack of standards and specifications. I explain why there is this desk. And finally, the stakeholder. We need brave stakeholders. People who will say, I'm going to build this here, I'm going to pay for it, and I want the concrete to be sustainable. And I'm ready to pay for that. I want serious studies. My concrete will not have the normal environmental impact. Okay? You could do it here. Okay? Uh, but... Huh? Okay. Um, I, I just want to show this slide very quickly. It's the second before last slide, so I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish. This is the result of that study that I told you about that has been published in which we, we devised um, strategies to make concrete more sustainable. And even though I'm not going to go into the list of strategies, I'm going to mention the groups of strategies. So we have a group in which we work in the mix composition. Basically, we change the materials, the raw materials. Then another group of strategies that has to do with materials man manufacturing, okay, efficiency. Then another group of strategies that has to do with concrete mixing. You know, concrete needs to be mixed, okay? And it can be done in a more efficient way than it is being done now. Then we have on-site application, same thing, technological improvement, we need it. Then finally, this is probably most important, in-service performance, okay? So, as I told you, costs and environmental costs, uh, they depend in, uh, they depend on the time frame. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to, to finish. Uh, so if we have a, a longer service life, in practical terms, we cut down on the env environmental impacts per year. Okay? And finally, end of life. So this is the last slide. This is, these are the conclusions that we came to. Uh, so we prioritized the most promising areas to boost sustainable concrete. This is where research should be made. This is where the money should be put, okay, to make concrete more sustainable. Improve the durability. These two sentences are, are deliberately provocative. Durability helps saving the environment. We increase durability, we save the environment. Let's take also measures to cease the dependence of durability on strength. Because if you only get durability, if the concrete is strong, that means that we have to use large amounts of cement to get durability. However, that should not be necessary. So that's the provocative sentence. Strength damages the environment. If I'm going to, to, to design a building that needs to be durable, and I'm going to make it more strong or stronger than it is needed, I'm harming the environment. Think about that a little bit. Okay? Too strong, unnecessarily strong is bad. Think about it. I can explain it later on uh, in more detail. We should move in the direction of non-conventional materials, especially all materials that can replace conventional binders, especially all materials that are now treated as byproducts and waste. Those are the materials that we need to put inside concrete. We need to build the data about environmental impacts and costs. The best way to ruin a good idea is to sell it and lie about it. Give wrong data, 
people check it, okay, so I'm going to try this uh, sustainable concrete, and then you come to the conclusion that it does not work. That's terrible because people will not use sustainable concrete anymore. Okay, so we need to do it with data. Finally, I've already talked about that, performance-based design, and as a one last uh, proposition, concrete technology. There is lots that we can do to improve concrete technology. I'm sorry I took a little bit longer than, than expected. Thank you. Maybe you can just stay for one. Thank you very much for this because uh, Mr. Highland has one question for you. Yes, I, I, if you don't mind, would you please elaborate on that one point about improving the concrete, which is therefore not necessarily the best for the environment? I'd, I'd really like to hear that. A few minutes on that, if you'd be so kind. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I will do that. Now, let's imagine that you can have the same... Uh, I will have to start from the beginning. How does concrete get strong? How does concrete get durable? same mechanism. It's basically by being very efficient from the point of view of interlock of the particles. Okay, so if the particles can be more interlocked and the pores can be reduced, you get the stronger concrete and the more durable concrete. However, normally that is done through using more cement. Cement makes the concrete less porous, which is good for strength, and is good for durability. Now, the United States, the vast, vast, vast majority of construction in the United States is still short, short buildings, small buildings. How strong do you, do you think that concrete needs to be? Not very strong. Not very strong. But do you want it to be durable? You do. The problem today is that to achieve the durability especially, for example, by the sea, to achieve an, ex uh, an acceptable durability, let's say 50 years, okay, you need to have a cement that has a strength class very high, which means that you are going to use lots of cement to make a concrete that is durable enough, but too strong. So when I say strength damages the, envi the environment, what I'm saying is, if you could do the same concrete with less strength, which means less cement, and the same durability, that would be perfect, because that's good enough for all the short buildings. Thank okay? You. You're welcome. Maybe so one, so one uh, question, because the professor is on the, on the floor. So you mentioned this, this uh, in uh, durability, uh, so if we have something longer, we can save the environment. But from the economic perspective, staying longer and not moving forward the economic movement development can be as well resist the economic growth. There is as an opposite. So we have better to find a, a balance. For example, if we have a smartphone. We prove it that this can in decrease the economic uh, the growth. So we have as a to leave companies to move forward, but at the same time to save environment. We should say multi. But what do you think here? It's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, now, houses are not cell, cell phones. That's that's the first part of the of the answer. Cell phones, you know, if you have a cell phone from today it is incredibly much better than a cell phone from five years ago, and it's going to be much, much worse than a cell phone from five years from now, okay? So houses do not have such a strong evolution, okay? The way to boost economy cannot be what you were implicitly arguing for, which is, let's make houses that break down very quickly and then have to replace them, and that helps the economy. That's not the way. There is another thing that is also important for, for the economy, which is rehabilitation. So a house that lasts for longer, lasts for longer if it is properly 
maintained and rehabilitated. And that also helps the economy. Okay? So, I totally understand that in most cases, helping the economy means doing something bad to the environment. Most cases. So we need to have a balance here. And humanity has proved that we can move forward and forward. We have the, the most rich nations have the strictest environmental policy. So it is possible. Right? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Any question for Professor Brito? OK, Sadia, I will come to you. You can do as for uh, Mr. Highland if you have. Thank you for a remarkable presentation. I would like to hear more about the concrete waste, uh, the construction waste concrete, as we have a lot of construction waste in Kosovo. Although we have built a lot, we have also destroyed a lot. And uh, I would like to, to know how concretely we can build strategies on using this concrete waste that is harming the environment and, and also the visual landscape that we have in Kosovo, a beautiful landscape. Thank you. Okay. This is a very complicated answer. Uh, you have to act in many areas. One area that you can act on is uh, uh, regulation. Okay? Regulations should be strict on dumping. Okay? I'm not advocating that you start now and you ban dumping of CDW, of construction demolition waste. That has been done already in Denmark. The Danish abolished construction demolition waste dumping. So that means that if you have something to dump, you have to do something about it. Okay? So you have to take it to some, someone who solves your problem. And how do they solve the problem? They separate the construction demolition waste by materials, by their potential applications, and then they provide a service which is good recycled aggregates, good recycled plastic, good recycled steel, good recycled timber, okay? They provide service, but that costs money. So one needs to have an economy that works like that. Another, another, uh, 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 another way of doing it is what I'm doing here, is uh, uh, help technicians to start applying materials in a more sustainable way, to start using unconventional materials, namely construction and demolition waste. We should have at university, I, in my university this still does not exist, so I'm just proposing something that I ca have not been able to do, we should have courses on recycled aggregate concrete. And that would help. So we should have also, and this is politics, we should ha have also, um, we call it, I don't know how you say it in, in the United States, the stick and the carrot. The stick and the carrot. It, the, it is? OK. So what is the stick in this case? The stick is um, uh, uh, you will pay more money to get uh, the, uh, the alternative of the, of the recycled aggregates, which is natural stone, quarries, you'll have to pay higher taxes. That's the stick. What is the carrot? The carrot can be something like, if you apply recycled aggregates, you get a low tax in the, your building. Okay? Another type of stick plus carrot would be the, the, the national authorities would make a regulation in which they say it is compulsory to use a certain percentage of recycled aggregates in every type of building, in every type of road. Okay? And I can tell you that if, if that percentage is, say, 5 or 10 percent, there would be no technical losses from this measure. And it would take just one good minister, one good prime minister to say, look, from now on, everything in Kosovo will be built with 5% of recycled materials. Otherwise, it is not allowed. Okay, there are other measures, of course, the supply and, the supply, uh, the, the, the supply and demand change 
needs to be worked, so you need to have recycling plants, and you need to have people who will use the products of the recycling plants, people who are ready to pay for the expenses of the recycling plants. So this is not a process that one can do like this. But I'm guessing if the government said you have to use recycled plants, recycled aggregates, recycled aggregates would become something that people would be ready to pay for. Okay? And then if people are ready to pay for something, there are other people who will get that something for them. Okay? So that's, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, we have a, our colleague, Professor from School of Architecture. Banners, please. Take the floor. It's for Professor uh, Mr. Highland or for Professor? Yeah. Professor Brito. Okay. Yeah, two, two questions, Max, because we will close. Otherwise, we will have a, a next session with Professor Brito with the, department, with the Faculty of Construction and Architecture after it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, I like this uh, idea of conventional materials and co unconventional uh, thinking. Uh, what do you think is the role of architects actually? Uh, what is the role of? The role of architects okay. as designers um, in order to change uh, the, the, the way of uh, how we think of unconventional uh, materials and even structures. Uh, and, Basically, the conventional way of thinking of architects and engineers today, it's uh, form, structure, and materials. We think at the end for the materials. And uh, I uh, strongly promote the new structuralism, uh, which means that the material is in the, it's in the forefront, then we have the structure and we have the form. <laughs> and uh, uh, how, how do you think we can actually take out this fear uh, of using unconventional way of thinking and how, uh, which are the, the strategies uh, so this is my uh, the first part of the question, and and the, the second part is can I, can, how, I answer, how, can I answer that part? Okay, okay, uh, okay. Fortunately, architects do not structural design; they don't do structural design. That's very fortunate. Fortunately, they do many other things. Okay, and so very often the materials that are used in a house are stipulated, are chosen by the architects. So. Even though I talk here about structural concrete, you have all the other materials which are non-structural, which is you who decides how to use them. So if architects have the attitude of using unconventional materials, materials that are not only sustainable, but they reduce the impacts of, they can be actually environmental negative or uh, positive according to the way you look at it, then architects are absolutely fundamental in this revolution of, of sustainable construction, sustainable construction design. Uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, architects are indispensable. Okay, and then my second part of the question is, how do you see the hybrid constructions actually in terms of- How do of I see? Hybrid, hybrid constructions and structures. Uh, well, uh, concrete is a hybrid. Hybrid. Still in, 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 in uh, concrete? No. Uh, actually, combining concrete and wood, like in terms of 2080, using. Uh, it, it's not anymore an unconventional way of constructing, but I, actually in the US concrete? now it's. Concrete and, and timber, right? Yeah, and timber, yeah. yes. What, what, I, is the, what are the benefits know, of doing even less though, far, let's say? Even though I, 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 I do believe, seriously believe, in, based on scientific facts that concrete is the best material, even from the from a, a environmental point of view. Uh, unlike other people who are lobbyists for steel or for concrete or for timber, I don't lobby for any material. I love all materials. You love all, materials. all materials. All materials are good. Okay? You just need to know what they can do and what they cannot do. Okay? So, Wood and, and concrete, for sure. Why not? Just take into account the different characteristics and try to understand whether that makes sense. And I understand that you are an architect, right? Okay, so if you think it fits your purposes, that for me is good enough. Because you are the one who's going to, 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 
to stipulate what the building will, is going to look like. It's not me, I'm a structural engineer, it's you. So if you think you, you, you sh we should do it with, with timber, we do it with timber. But you have to understand that timber is, has certain characteristics uh, and you have to take those, those characteristics into account. Okay, so steel, uh, I'm sorry, uh, timber and concrete, I know several colleagues of mine who are doing research on that and it's per perfectly feasible. But even in structures, okay, in structures, outside structures, of course. Yeah, thank you. Don't go without a group picture all together here. This is a request from Mr. From Mr. Hadland, so, and <laughs> he wanted to. Uh, the Vice Dean of Construction Engineering. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a very big pleasure to, to have your presentation. And uh, Mr. Highland also, because uh, the idea is investment, so then the improvement of materials will go on. Uh, Kosovo has a carbon uh, waste because our uh, energy is uh, with carbon. And uh, environmentally is very bad. Uh, uh, recycled aggregates, if we combine with the waste, so the fly ash that comes from the waste, can be a challenge. People have done some work in Kosovo, but for Kosovo's environment, let's say, can we put uh, some basic in this direction at UBT uh, with your support okay. and uh, also the, uh, the USA support and hopefully to have a uh, research activity for the staff and people here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm surprised that you say fly ash is a problem. Because in my country, fly ash, lack of fly ash is a problem. Because in my country, we went, in my opinion, too fast in terms of decarbonation of the energy, and we stopped all thermal uh, 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 plants. Okay, so everything that was using uh, that was using coal, okay, to make energy, we stop them. I think it's a bad move, but a, a move. But I'm not going to discuss that now. Now, the the, the the fly ash in my country it has been used fully, mostly in the concrete industry, because fly ash re can replace concrete with several advantages, which are less costly, okay? They have certain, uh, certain technical characteristics, which, uh, for example, they reduce shrinkage, okay? They, 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 they reduce some problems that have to do with the very high hydraulicity of cement, okay? So, in my country, the, the cement that was being most used is a cement that contains uh, a relatively large percentage of fly ash. So that's already the standard. The standard is no longer cement, pure cement, what we call ordinary, ordinary Portland cement. It is no, no, no longer the rule. The rule is already cement with a percentage of fly ash. The problem now in Portugal is that we have no longer fly ash. So our cement companies are going crazy because they have to get cement from Spain or they are trying to use some other thing instead of fly ash. Can I just have one more question, please? One more, just one. I'm sorry? Do you fly, fly ash, fly ash uh, is that what you wanted to know? Fly, fly ash is the result of burning coal. Okay, so when you burn coal, you get fly ash as, as, a, as a byproduct, and you don't know what to do with it, except that the, the cement industry discovered that it was excellent to replace cement. So, so uh, Professor, do you really think the global flight away from cement and the global problem all the international cement companies are having right now, is that situation going to get worse? Is it, it, is, is it sustainable? Or will there be a concrete way, concrete can come back to the fore, back to prominence, in light of all that's happening globally against it, which, I mean, I and you and all of us here today know what that's all about. 
But by God, concrete, it's pretty difficult to imagine a world that functions without concrete. What the hell is going to replace it? Yes, yes. Um, well, there are several things to say about that. One is just a, a, a cute story. I once made a, um, a, a presentation uh, in the architect faculty in my country, and the, 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 the speech was called Concrete, the Great Satan. The great Satan. Sa yeah, Satan. Okay, so that was my presentation, and then I, I moved on to, yeah. to other, other stuff, trying to dismantle that notion. People believe that concrete is terrible for the environment. What is the truth? Yes, it is terrible. The alternatives would be much worse. Exactly. This is the truth, okay? Yes, it is terrible. That's why I want it to be more sustainable, okay? But the alternatives are much worse, okay? So there is no, no uh, option, uh, no, nothing that, uh, now, nothing that can replace the concept of concrete. Only concrete, when you say concrete, nowadays concrete means hundreds of types of concrete. People don't understand this. There's no longer concrete. It's hundreds of types of concrete. Okay, just based on materials. Okay, so concrete as a whole, in my opinion, cannot replace, be replaced. It should not be replaced until we find a better alternative. And I have to say this. Developed countries do not have the right to tell non-developed countries not to build. Okay, so I can say that Portugal is a developed country. I don't have the right to tell India to not build. And if India builds to the standards that we think are reasonable, there's going to be a big, big need of concrete. Concrete is going to go on growing. So what we need to do, and this is the speech we need to make it less impacting per ton, okay? We, but, and this is the last thing I want to tell you, most people don't understand that if we were to have the best environment, we would not have comfort, we would not have economy, we would not have life. Every time you breathe, you send carbon into the atmosphere. Anyone here who wants to stop breathing? No. Any, any candidate? Okay. So, okay. So the world would be much better from an environmental point of view if the human race died? Yes, but I don't want to die. Okay, so we have to face, we have to have a balance here. We have to be pragmatic being pragmatic does not mean that we accept things as they are. We need to fight the things as they are, but in a pragmatic way. I'm not going to tell India to stop building, okay? I'm just going to try to help India build with more sustainability, okay? And this is, this is what we really should do. That applies to Portugal, that applies to Kosovo, that even applies to the United States, okay? So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really a pleasure. And, and use this opportunity. I will take it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think we had very, very great uh, uh, discussion today. And thank you also Diaspora Net Business Network being here with us. And, 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 and of course, we thank you, the, the Faculty of Architecture and Civil Engineering and uh, all the departments of UBT. And as uh, we said before, uh, we in UBT, we try to, to develop a small scale system uh, according to those trends, to the reflection of, of smart, of sustainable, innovation-based ecosystem. Uh, physical here in this small area, you have 350 hectares about. We have only three and a half hectares. So the new urbanism 
uh, you can think on, on, on a street area, on a building area, in a, a bit more bigger, like three hectares area, and then 300 in the region. So in, I think this is the beauty of this system thinking from small to large, this, this concept, but by the, all of this means the human nature, the sustainability base is in the, in, the, in the middle. And I think we are talking today about student-centered university, we are talking about uh, human-centered system design, human-centered uh, new urbanism, and so on. So, so I think it's, it's important, and, and UBT is trying to have those four components in the next years. So the smart infrastructure, which I think is fill and support a lot of new knowledge in the next area to consider new models, because I saw even, we talked yesterday, Professor, there are a lot of publication concrete. I saw that there is still a lot of question to be <laughs> solved. It's a positive a component for Department of Material Science. But as for all the things, uh, because I consider we are living in a knowledge convergence, and in this knowledge-based convergence or convergence revolution, which is behind of uh, after the information revolution, after the industrial revolution, uh, after the agricultural revolution, we are in a very high a complex system which we need to, to solve the problems in order to increase the quality. Otherwise, we can have problem as we are, issue the problem with environment, with the planet, with growth, with jobs, uh, with food, with health, and so on. So in this case, we try to, to, to create this 5S, we call small-scale, smart, sustainable uh, systems uh, in order to compete everything what we try to say and what we can, why we can do this and we try because we have almost 150 uh, departments or schools that we, uh, means uh, fields of studies that we can cover the cost system from the perspective of arts, from the perspective of music, culture, engineering, business, law, uh, political aspects, media, healthcare, and so on. So this is why I think we have a very good university, and this is the reason why the core of university is as a core place for development together with the political commitment and businesses and so on, a place which can be very innovative based and can generate more quality of life, better jobs, better competitiveness, better uh, growth, uh, a better innovation-based society, digitalization, security, and, and so on. And we believe on it. We try to have this physical small-scale city, which we call smart city. When you talk for university, you call for university 4.0. And so on. So, so quite to to confirm and and uh, the contribution you made today and 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 as of before, it's just just a value add in the forming, not only the concept but seeing the impact. We we try to measure the impacts on the uh, let's say micro, but as a macro level, and we just confirm that this makes sense. 2021, we generate here in the three hectares, 1,000 new jobs. Can you imagine, in one year, 1,000 new jobs. Last year, the same. We impact education, we impact foreign direct investment because we succeed to invite US companies to invest here, Israeli companies, German companies, Austrian companies, European, UK, and so on. So we, we confirm that this is a kind of magnet, a, a kind of weighting factors that you interact with different values, and then you can generate values, and you growing and development, and so on. So, so we have a belief on in insight. We have a, a let's say passion and spirit, and we are very much looking forward to to do. And every department, every dean and co dean and professors and students are trying to think and build this concept of sustainable, smart based innovation ecosystem. And I have to thank all for. Contribution, I have to thank the organizing committee, uh, the partner organization, uh, the, the people who stand behind days to prepare everything is going well in the media and, 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 and technicians and everything. And of course, thank you for presentation and make these things uh, great. Jim Jema uh, lecture is now live. It's not just a concept, it's just not a wish, it's made and will continue together forever. And I'm very happy that we have the Jim Jema building today, announced with, with personally, 
I'm very happy to have uh, Christopher Highland in the uh, uh, corporation and named and so on. And I have very uh, much happy to have business diaspora here. You know the message that they are bringing here. Can you imagine? The GDP, most GDP, the base development in Kosovo is made from the contribution of diaspora. They have so much heart. And, and I mean, I mean, I think ecosystem of, UB, of Kosovo cannot be closed. It is open with partners, with all the countries, but specifically with the points of ecosystem of diaspora in the world. I think this is our model which will stay for life long. And I believe on it, and we have to cult cultivate and curate so much this inter interactivity, cooperation, and, and generate more values for the entire concept. So thank you very much, and looking forward for the next. We need, uh, as we said, a picture, please, coming up all together, somewhere here in this, uh, some, some downstairs, and then we create together this. Yeah, please, 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 please. please.